Welcome everyone to our Sabbath morning divine service. Uh, so glad you could join us here on YouTube as we uh, premiere this uh, sermon for you today. Uh, and it is uh, a message that's really, really close to my heart. I'm glad to be with you again. Uh, my name is uh, Pastor Harley Southall. For those who are too, maybe tuning in, uh, visiting with us uh, for the first time, I'm the Associate Pastor of the Bow Desert Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it's uh, good to be with you uh, once again to share uh, a sermon and open the Word of God and to study together. Uh, so just super glad you're able to join us today. Our offering uh, this week is for the uh, Australian Union Conference. Uh, so, uh, of course, our offerings are going through the e-giving at this time. So uh, if that's just to let you know. And if you haven't already, just a quick reminder that you can do that. Uh, and I'm just going to offer a quick prayer over our offerings that we've uh, submitted through this week and right now as well. Bow heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you so much uh, for all the wonderful blessings that you've given us uh, in, in our life uh, and that we can have blessings to return to you. Uh, Lord, as we uh, return these tithes and these offerings to you, uh, we just pray that they will be multiplied in your service uh, to hasten your soon return. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I have a story uh, now just before we begin for the children. Uh, this one is a story from uh, that my grandfather told me uh, when I was uh, when I was a young lad. He always told me stories about when he was growing up back in the day. Uh, my grandfather was he grew up in America and in, in in the states. And in winter time, of course, it snows all over the ground. And one of the favorite things to do uh, was to go out and to and to slide on on sleds down hills. Uh, and you know, it's just go up and down, up and down all day long, and just have an absolute blast slipping and sliding. Now, his, uh, he, in his family, he had 11 siblings, 11 siblings, uh, and him and his brothers, they didn't actually have, uh, him, and his, him and his siblings, they didn't actually have uh, an, a proper sled. Instead, what they got was the, the bonnet of an old car, and they flipped it upside down, and they all sat on the bonnet, and that's what they used to slide down the hill. Uh, and they went, they set, so they set off one day to go to the hill, uh, where they would slide down, the neighbors, uh, the neighbor boys joined them, uh, and they went to the, to the to the hill, and the hill went down, and then it went over uh, a frozen lake, a frozen lake, a frozen frozen pond, and they would go up the hill, they would slide down and across the lake, about halfway, they would stop, uh, and then they'd drag the drag the bonnet of the car back up to the top of the hill, and they'd just go again and again, and I had an absolute blast all day long. Now, it came to the afternoon, and it was time to time to be heading back, and they're like, oh, you know, hmm. but they kept, they decided, we're going to keep going, and then their older brother, their big brother, Lawrence, came, and he, he, he was not just the big brother in that he was the older, he was the big brother in that he was big as well, and when they saw him, they're like, oh, Lawrence weighs a lot, and if he hopped on the sled with us, he, if he hopped on the car bonnet with us and slid down, we'd go very fast and go very far. And so Lawrence is coming, and they're like, Lawrence, ah, oh, you got to ride on the sled with us. Please, please, please. They were asking, begging. And Lawrence was like, oh, you know, Mom says it's time to go back home for, for dinner now. Uh, but, you know, even though he was the older brother, he was the big brother, he was still, he was still, you know, he still would like to slide down the hill as well if he was truly honest with himself. Uh, and so he decided, you know what? All right, one time, one time, I'll hop on the sled, we'll slide down together, and then I, we have, you have to promise me, though, that we'll all go home after that. And they say, yes, 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 we promise, we promise, we promise, we promise. And so they all pile in to the sled, and Lawrence, he goes at the very front, and he's very big, and he's very heavy. Uh, and the rest of them squeeze on, and they fit in, and they're, they're just all all fitting on there. All about six or seven of them are on this sled now. Uh, and they, one, two, three, and they push off. And oh boy, they realize that they are going a lot faster than they usually do. Not only did they push off, but they gave a big run up as well. And they're going down, and they're sliding so fast. And they come down to the bottom of the hill, and they're still picking up speed. And they hit the lake, and they start skidding across the lake. And usually about halfway across the lake, they're stopping. But this time, they're just still going across this lake. And the other side of the lake is coming up quick. And they're all holding on for dear life. And the other side of the lake... 
there's a big sand bank, a uh, snow bank, and kapoof, they all hit the snow bank and they all fly through the air, the bonnet flips upside down, legs and arms and bodies flying through the air, they all slam down into the snow, and they get up and they'll shake themselves off. Oh, everyone okay? Everyone okay? Yep, yep, yep. No broken bones, no, 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 just some bruises, just some cuts, okay, no broken bones though. Hey, where's Timmy? They're looking around, and the youngest of the youngest of the neighbor boys, they couldn't find him anywhere. He disappeared. They're like, where is he? Where is he? And then they see, sticking up two feet, just poking out of the top of the snow. <laughs> they, they pick him up by his feet, and they lift him up. He'd gone headfirst straight in and dived completely down and was stuck. And they pulled him up out of the snow. That's my... Uh, <laughs> little story for you guys today. I think it's a very, very funny story. Uh, and this is one of those stories that just helps you, helps re remind you that when you're having fun, you always got to make sure that you keep a level head about you and you don't do anything really stupid because someone could end up getting hurt. Luckily in this story, no one got hurt, but they, uh, they definitely learned their lesson and kept to the proper limits uh, in the future. Uh, times when they went up sl sledding and sliding. So that's our children's story for you today. Hope you kids enjoyed that. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to offer our main prayer uh, before we go into the service time, the, the sermon time. If you'll bow your heads with me once again. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we want to thank you so much uh, for your great love for us and for your leading and guiding through us through this last week uh, that we have now come to another Sabbath. We've had Sabbath school together and we've enjoyed the fellowship that that's brought, uh, being able to share uh, your, uh, your word uh, with, uh, with each other and to learn from it. And now, Lord, I just want to pray in a special way that you will anoint my lips as I open uh, the scriptures and we study the topic of the judgment today uh, and, and why it is so necessary. And Lord, we just pray that... Christ will be lifted up and that we will be drawn closer and closer to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Alright. Well, my message for today is entitled, Why a Judgment? Why is there a judgment? If God is so wise and he knows everything, why does he have to judge? Very good question. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to just share uh, a little bit of uh, b background for this idea of judgment. You know, I am uh, an amateur historian, uh, it's one of my hobbies, and whilst I am a student of World War II and I find it very, very interesting, and I, I play out different military campaigns and different board games and so forth, uh, and I'm fascinated to read about it in books and, and, and magazines and so forth, I never forget that Nazism, the, which drove Germany into uh, World War II, was driven by a racial ideology uh, and that was entirely satanic in its nature. You see, many of the high-ranking Nazi officials and SS officials, including you know Himmler, the, the leader of the, the, the Nazi SS, and Hitler himself, were involved in occult practices. Uh, and, uh, and, and they actually used the guidance of Satan, is, is clearly seen throughout this movement. Uh, and so while studying the, the, the military campaigns is one thing, to remember what's actually behind it, though, is, 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 is always important. You see, the, the, the Holocaust is also one of the most horrific events in human history. Uh, as during World War II, as it raged on, the Nazis decided to carry out a systematic genocide of the Jewish population in Europe. Between 1941 and 1945, across German-occupied Europe, Nazi, uh, J Nazis uh, carried out pogroms and mass shootings. Uh, they had a policy of extermination camps, uh, forced labor camps, uh, and the gas chambers uh, and, and gas vans in these German extermination camps, of course, are very, very well known for, because of their, it's just such a horrific thing to think about. You know, in the famous camps like Auschwitz and Dachau and Treblinka uh, and many others uh, throughout occupied Poland as well. And, you know, the European Jews were targeted uh, as a large part for, their, for extermination because of the, the racist ideology of the uh, Nazi movement. Uh, and, you know, this... During this time in which the, 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 the Nazis and their German collaborators, they are estimated to have killed around 6 million of Europe's Jews during this time. But it wasn't just Jews that they targeted as well. Uh, there were, they also murdered other uh, mass com com 
committed mass murders of other uh, groups such as ethnic Poles, uh, Soviet civilians, uh, and prisoners of war. Uh, the Roma, or also known as the Gypsies, the handicapped, uh, the political and political and religious dissidents, uh, including the Jehovah's Witnesses, and also homosexual men. And so, when we include all this death toll, it comes to something around 11 million people. And this is, of course, just just, just when you think about it, it's just a horrific and 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 a mind-boggling. Uh, uh, crime against humanity that was committed during this time. Now, after the war, uh, the and and and, and when after Nazism was defeated, the Nuremberg trials were the trials held by were the war, war crimes trials held by the victorious uh, Allied powers of uh, the Soviet Union, uh, Britain, France, and the USA. Uh, and they brought many of the high-ranking uh, Nazi officials who had been uh, complicit in this Holocaust to task and, you know, performed judgment uh, uh, upon them. And so, you know, this, these were very notable for being, you know, the, f the first kind of tr military tribunals of, of this kind, uh, and the, the political, military, judicial, and economic leadership of Nazi Germany, who uh, had been involved with this, were, uh, were brought up for their crimes against humanity. The biggest uh, fish that was really caught at the Nuremberg trials that to be judged was Hermann Göring, who was the leader of the Luftwaffe, or the, the, the German Air Force during this time. He was originally the second highest ranked uh, member of the Nazi party and Hitler's designated successor. Uh, but he fell out of favor with Hitler uh, in April 1945, uh, and as a result, though, he was the highest ranking Nazi official to be tried at Nuremberg. Uh, now, just the night before, after he was, after he was you know, guilty and he was sentenced to death, the night before his, uh, his, his scheduled execution, he actually committed uh, suicide himself. Now, also, many of the other high-ranking Nazi officials, such as Goebbels, Himmler, and even Adolf Hitler himself, also committed suicide uh, before being captured which leads me to ask a question why is it that what this this prospect of judgment for the crimes that you have committed why is it so such a scary thing that people are willing to commit suicide to end their own lives rather than face the judgment that is coming upon them why what is so uh, so so terrifying about this idea of judgment you see these guys committed the, the, the suicide in order to escape uh, the justice that was coming against them. Uh, but we can know that in the end, there is a judgment that they are not going to escape. And that, of course, is God's judgment. But now, that le then leads us to the next question. Okay, if there is a judgment that none of us are going to escape, how should we feel in regards to that? You see, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. You see, the Bible very clearly says that we all, every human being, will be judged by God. Every single one of us, uh, at some point, is going to come before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, and we are going to be judged according to what we have done, whether it is good or whether it is bad. Uh, Hebrews 9.25 says, uh, and, it is, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. You see, the judgment is so serious to God that he actually resurrects the dead in order to judge them uh, and to bring them to this appointment. You see, you also watching this right now, will also have to stand in this judgment. So the question I have to ask is, how does that make you feel? How does that make you feel to know that you are going to come before the judgment seat of Christ? Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a very uh, unique understanding of the judgment amongst our uh, Christian brothers and sisters, and that's according to our understanding of these two verses, Daniel 8, 14 uh, and Daniel 7, verse 10, uh, where he said unto me, Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Uh, and, of course, in seven ten, where it talks about the court being seated and the books were being opened. And we see that throughout our prophetic understanding, uh, through the prophecies in the book of Daniel, uh, there is very clearly there is a, a judgment that happens before the return of Christ. Uh, this is a judgment in th that is investigative in nature, in that it's not just it's not just uh, it's not just a pronunciation, 
but rather an, an, an investigation, a looking at all of the facts to see what is uh, what is going to be happening. Now, we know as, as we, we believe as Seventh-day Adventists, and I'm summarizing it a lot here because the, the, the actual dates and, and how it all fits in and our understanding of this isn't the focus of the sermon, but as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that this judgment, this cleansing of the sanctuary, which was uh, called the Day of Judgment in the Jewish uh, in the Jewish economy, was actually, uh, what actually began uh, in, in 1844 in heaven, not here on earth, but in, uh, in heaven in the year 1844. 44. And ever since this time, Jesus has been doing this work of an investigative judgment uh, in, for each individual's case in heaven. But a couple questions. First of all, why has it taken so long? Why does he need to investigate before he judges? And, 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 and what makes God the perfect judge? Well, what makes God the perfect judge? I'll start with answering that first. First John chapter 4, verse 8 says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. You see, this is why he is the perfect judge. I am so glad that this verse is in the Bible. And this verse is one of those most, the most definitive verses about who God is that we have out there. Because it very clearly says that the one who is in charge of the judgment actually has a loving, uh, actually has a loving nature towards us, a loving disposition towards us. Now, he is also a very just God. He's not going to let, uh, he's not, he, he you know, the breaking of the law demands justice be fulfilled. But to know that God is love, to know that the judge is someone who has a good disposition towards you, should be something that uh, that encourages you. And also, what we're going to see today is that God's love is actually revealed through this judgment. Through the judgment. You see, the other thing that makes God the perfect judge, uh, we, we see here in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. It says, For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You see, even though we can be tricked by, uh, by a, a phony preacher or, you know, we, you know people have been, we, I, I know stories of people who've been you know, misled by someone that they were dating and then once they actually got married, they found out they were a completely different person. You know, we can, we can be misled by the outward actions of people. God never is misled. He knows the heart. You could, you know, you could get to heaven, for example, and I could not be there. I might not be there. And you'd be like, wait a second. I thought, you know, Pastor Harley was this, this, this really good, good guy. And, you know, he, he always preached awesome, amazing sermons. And he was a very upstanding citizen. Why isn't he here in heaven? And, you know, I could have pulled the wool over your eyes and be an absolute charlatan. But God would have, no, this wouldn't have tricked God. God would have known. This is why God is the perfect judge because he knows the heart but we don't know the heart so <coughs> that leads us to uh to 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 this next understanding here uh hebrews chapter 10 verses 35 and 36 mm, i got a little typo there my apologies um therefore do not cast away your confidence which has great reward for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of god you may receive the promise you see, I want to highlight something that's very important. There is a belief in Christianity what's called once saved, always saved. Uh, this idea of once you have been saved by God, that nothing will ever take away that salvation. Now, while we can have assurance that he who has begun a good work in us will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, the Bible also says that we need to have endurance and we, ha we, we, we have to be aware that we do not cast away our confidence because we, we, we need to make sure that we... Uh, endure to be able to receive the promise. So therefore, this verse is indicating that those who kind of start the journey but don't endure all the way don't receive the promise. Therefore, they're not, uh, you know, once saved, always saved, doesn't actually be, isn't actually taught according to this passage. Continuing on in the same passage, uh, verses 37 down to verse 39, for yet, as he's quoting the, he's quoting the Old Testament, which is why it's capitalized in the New King James, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. So here he's quoting from the book of Habakkuk, and he says it's possible to draw back. The just will live by faith, but guess what? Even if you do live by faith, if you do decide to draw back, God, uh, God will not be able to not, not, not save you, basically. 
Uh, we are not those who draw back into perdition. Now, this word perdition is very interesting. It's it, G- Judas Iscariot is called the son of perdition. And it's very interesting because the Bible says that Judas's name, when he went out and, they, and, they, and, the, and the disciples performed many miracles and so forth, uh, they came back to Jesus and, and Jesus said, Hey, look, don't be excited about the miracles that you perform, but be excited about the fact that your name is written in the books of heaven. And Judas was one of those men whose name was written in the book of heaven, yet we know that Judas didn't, didn't, uh, wasn't saved. He died a lost man. Therefore, we know it is possible to lose salvation. Now, why am I, I talking about this? Uh, actually, I will look at one more verse, and, I'll, and then I'll let you know the, the, the reason why this is so important. 2 Peter 2.20 For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. So in other words, if you have escaped the, the, the corruption uh, in, in, in the world and have come to the full knowledge of, of, of Jesus, but are then later entangled in it again, it says... You, you, it would have been better if you'd never even known in the first place. The latter end is worse than the beginning. And this is re- the reason why the judgment is so important. And that's because God treasures freedom of choice very highly. Because only when the choice to love exists can love exist. And God is love. You see, the power of choice remains with the believer even after they have accepted Jesus. Jesus doesn't take away their choice to then choose to reject him. No, he allows them to have that choice because that is the only way that love can be genuine. Your human free will must be finalized and that is why there has to be a judgment before the second coming. You see, it is possible to reject this gift of salvation once we have received it. And so, and it's also possible for people to pull the wool over others' eyes. Uh, and so that even after they have rejected it, they can still be sitting in church and be, by all appearances be looking like someone who is saved when they are not. And as a result, God needs to judge who is not just on the outward, but who is on the inward, qualified and ready for heaven. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9.27 says, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul recognized the fact that he could lose his salvation, and so he uh, did everything he could to make sure he stayed disciplined and walking with Jesus. Now, this is, you know, a little bit kind of, you know, not what necessarily what we like to hear, this kind of message, to, to know that, oh, you know, it's possible to lose one's salvation. And here you seem, I, I seem to remember just giving you a hard time and making you discouraged and making you afraid that you would never be good enough to be saved. And I want to, I, I would hope that you'll just bear with me for a little while longer through this sermon because it gets a lot better, trust me. Now, this then brings me to the second part of the sermon, though, where now that we've established that fact, that it is possible to lose salvation and that it is possible for also someone to, to appear saved when they're not, we need to then look at this next idea of what exactly is the biblical idea of a judgment. Now, judgment is an interesting word because it's one word, but it has like two different meanings to it that are so closely related that we sometimes overlap them without realizing it. And it's very important that we understand the differences between these two different stages of judgment. You see, there is an investigatory stage of judgment and there is the sentencing stage of judgment. If you're ever in a court and you go, you know, and there's going to be a, a time of judgment, there is a case presented evidence presented uh, and, and, and witnesses presented and it, it, it all goes backwards and forwards for a while and cases are made and all the while we are making judgments while the, the final sentence which is the judgment hasn't been pronounced that we are the, 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 the judge and the, and, and, and the jury are judging and involved in judgment before the actual judgment at the end comes out at uh, when the, when the gavel hits the podium, so we all understand that that that, that now that, that that judgment is involved in these two different stages, um, and we also understand that God has the ability to know the heart, making Him the perfect judge. Now, if He has the ability to know the heart, making Him the perfect judge, why then does He investigate? Why would he need to do that first part where the, the, the evidence is being presented and the case is being decided if he can just 
so he's so wise and so knowledgeable knowing all things happening at all times in the universe why then does he need to have this kind of process a slow process even for investigatory judgment Isaiah 46 9 to 10 says uh, remember the former things of old for I am God and there is no other I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure you see in order to understand why God investigates even though he knows everything we need to go back to the beginning to understand God's judgments at the end is actually important that we understand God's judgments at the very beginning. Genesis 3, 8. This verse is in context is just after Adam and Eve have eaten the forbidden fruit and they have realized that they're naked and they have sewed fig leaves together uh, and, 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 and sin has entered into the world. And, they, and it says in verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now I have a question for you. Is it possible to hide from God? No, it's not possible to hide from God. Is it possible to hide from God behind a tree, as Adam and Eve have done? No, it's not possible to hide from God behind a tree. So why are they hiding from God? It's because they are feeling in themselves guilt and shame for the sin that they have committed. The same way, you know, the same reason why when each of us were young children and we did something, we misbehaved and disobeyed our parents, we often would run and hide underneath the bed or in the closet or, you know, all different places we would hide to try and escape the judgment that we knew that was coming. Continuing on, along in Genesis 3, verses 9 to 11. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? What an interesting question. You see, does God know where Adam is? Yes, of course he knows where Adam is. Then why is he asking? You know, but he is, what he's doing right here, actually, just notice this. He is investigating. He is investigating right now. He is investigating where Adam is, even though he knows. He's asking the question, Where are you? He's asking the question not for his benefit, but for Adam's benefit. The same reason why when you walk into a room and you see, you know, your little toddler, uh, your, your, your child, your son or your daughter who has scribbled with a crayon all over the wall, and you ask, did you draw on the wall? Did you scribble on the wall? You know they did it. They got the crayon in their hand. They're covered in, in color all over from head to foot. You know that they did it. But yet you still ask the question, not for your benefit, but for their benefit. You see, Adam goes, Adam replies, he says, he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? You see, God is asking all these questions of Adam, even though he knows the answer. He is investigating before he actually will pronounce the judgment. You see, the reason that God does this is because the judged, the one who is being judged, needs to understand that the judgment that is coming is just and fair. Is just and fair. And that's what happens in the sto- in, that in, in Genesis 3. God continues on. They pronounce the judgment upon the serpent, upon Adam, and upon Eve. And they have to recognize that it is fair because God has been... A- he didn't just come down and say, boom, you've done this. You know, that just leads to more rebellion. But God is a God of love. He wants to win hearts back. And he wins hearts back in this way. Now, we don't just see this in in Genesis 3. We actually see it in the next chapter as well. Check this out. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9. Uh, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. So get this. The, 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 The voice of Abel's blood is crying to God from the ground. In other words, God knows what has happened. The evidence is all there. But he still comes down and he asks Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And what have you done? You see, once again, uh, God, uh, God is, 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 it's clear that 
God knows what's happening, but he is investigating in this way to help the judged understand that he, th- God, is just and fair. He's not a capricious and, 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 and arbitrary God, but one who actually wants to win our hearts back even after we have sinned. Uh, Genesis chapter 6. Uh, sorry, I got the wrong reference here. Genesis chapter 6. Uh, it says, And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great uh, in the earth, and that every intent and thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I'll get the correct reference for you there. Let me just look it up. I know it's Genesis 6. I believe it might be. It is, it's Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. So apologies for that. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Here we see God coming down once again, and he examines the evidence. He sees that, you know, there is, the, that finally the, 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 the people who have been following God, the, the sons of God, they've, they've taken uh, wives from the, do- the, 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 the daughters of men, uh, the children of men, uh, and as a result they are, there's no more good people left save for Noah. So he examines all the evidence. He sees, looking at the heart, that it's only evil continually. And he comes to his conclusion to judge the earth with water. He investigates before he judges. Uh, and not only that, but he makes himself visible before he judges so that others know that he is fair. Uh, and we see that also once again in Genesis chapter 11, verse 5. We see this pattern after pattern after pattern of this investigation before judgment. Well, this, in, this judgment before judgment, in a sense. Uh, Genesis 11, verse 5, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. You see the Tower of Babel is being erected, and God comes down and he investigates what's going on. Before he pronounces his judgment against them. But this all leads to what I reckon is probably one of the most important passages in scriptures, in, in, in scripture, to understanding why God judges in this way. And that is in Genesis chapter 18. Now a little bit of context for this. In Genesis 18, uh, Abraham is relaxing, in well not relaxing, but kind of sheltering in his tent uh, during the heat of the day. Uh, and he sees some men walking towards him through the desert. And he says to them, oh, he sees them. He invites them into his into his into his into his tent to, to rest and to and to refresh them. Uh, as 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 anyone who who has experienced Middle Eastern hospitality knows, the most hospitable kind of people in the world. And so he, he he invites them in. And in the course of the conversation, it is revealed that these aren't just ordinary uh, ordinary uh, wayfarers, but instead this is actually the Lord and two angels uh, that are with him. Uh, they they talk with Abraham and they let him know that Sarah is going to ha- have a uh, Sarah is going to have a, a son. Uh, she laughs and she says, "Oh wait, no, I didn't laugh." He said, "No, you laughed, you laughed." And then they get up in verse sixteen. Then the men arose from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with, went with them to send them on the way. So these guys they're they're on their way to Sodom, and Abraham he 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 sees okay you're off on your way to Sodom so I'll, I'll help you along the way just for the first little bit so he goes with them he walks with them for a little while showing them the way to Sodom he's being a hospitable guide uh, and, and 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 they're making their way down to Sodom and then we get this internal monologue from the Lord and it's just absolutely fascinating and the Lord said shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. So, the Lord speaks to him and says, says, you know, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm going to do? What's he going to do? He's going to basically nuke uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, I can't, I can't hide this from Abraham because Abraham's going to become a great and mighty nation. His followers, his descendants, his descendants, they're going to, uh, they need to be raised properly to know who I am, that they may also be righteous and just. And if Abraham just woke up one day uh, from his nap to see a mushroom cloud coming over Sodom and Gomorrah, he might wonder what kind of God he is serving. And it would not be the true picture of God that he wants him to have. 
So he says, I cannot hide from Abraham what I am going to do. So the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, uh, and because their sin is very grave, so he already knows that their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against that it, against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. So we see the Lord here investigating what's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Even though he already knows that their sin is very great, he's going to go down and see whether it is altogether as he has heard. And he says this to Abraham. And Abraham realizes what's going on. There is going to, there's no way Sodom and Gomorrah are going to survive this. And so Abraham, as they're, they're kind of, you kind of get this picture in your mind's eye of, of the Lord standing over, uh, over a hill. You know, in the, 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 in the valley, we, you see Sodom and Gomorrah stretched out in the plain below. And there's like a kind of a cliff top. And the, and the Lord's standing there and the, and the, and the two angels are, are, are making their way down the path. And Abraham is, re, is he's, he's, he's thinking about what's going on. And he realizes, man. This is, this is some heavy stuff. And so he approaches God, approaches the Lord. He, he kind of comes, draws closely up, up behind him and he says, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? You know, suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing. As this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Wow. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Think about the implications of what Abraham has just said here. You see, who is being judged right now? Who is being judged? God is being judged by Abraham. God is being judged by Abraham because Abraham is saying, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? You know, it would be, you know, you'd, it wouldn't be right, it wouldn't be a righteous thing to do. It wouldn't be a right thing to do to kill 50 righteous people amongst all of the wicked in Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, now we see why God investigates before he judges. As I said many, many times before, it's not for his benefit that he investigates, but for our benefit, for those watching on, for those who need to see that he is just and that he is fair, and that the judge of all the earth does do what is right. You see, God investigates before he judges to inspire us and those who see his judgments. Uh, with confidence in his leadership and in his authority and his fairness and in his, in his authenticity and worthiness of our worship. Abraham is judging the judge. Not for... And, and, and we see now that the judgment is to show the universe that God is fair. In the judgment, God is on trial just as much as we are. You see, because free will must be finalized, because free will must be decided, and, and it must be demonstrated that this person has chosen yes and this person has cho chosen no, God has to be open to the universe to allow them to see that he is just and he is fair in who he chooses to save and who he uh, chooses to damn. So God performs the judgment out in the open. God investigates before he takes action in order to give us confidence in his leadership and in his fairness. You see, one time I was on Facebook or somewhere, I don't know where I was, but one of those forums or something like that. And <clears throat> as you do in my line of work, you stumble upon well, I mean, no, no, anyway, I mean, even not just in my line of work, but anyone who's been on Facebook, you will inevitably f stumble upon somewhere along the lines a debate about whether or not God exists uh, between you know people on the internet. It's what it's famous for, and usually these are quite um, pointless; they get nowhere. Uh, but 
they're, they're, they, they just rage on continually. It's the never-ending story of the internet. Anyway, I was not actually participating in this debate, but I stumbled upon one. And it wasn't between an Adventist, uh, but it was another Christian and an atheist. And they were arguing backwards and forwards. And the atheist was basically saying, how could you worship a God? How could you say that a God is loving who burns people forever in hell, who genocides entire populations, who floods the whole world, who does all these uh, you know, seemingly capricious and, 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 and vindictive things throughout scripture? How could you possibly say that this is a loving God? You know, you know, if, I, if, 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 we said, if we said, oh, look, you know, Hitler killed six, six, you know, 11 million people, but he was actually just a, a good guy, like, what would Hitler have to do to demonstrate that he really is a bad guy? And this is what he's, he's basically saying. What would God have to do to show you that he isn't actually love? He says he's love, but then he does all this unloving stuff, you know, to our eyes. How, you know, what would God, and this is what he was asking the guy, and, and the guy, and the Christian had no response to this. He's asking, what would God have to do to prove to you that he isn't loving, even though he says he is. Because if the actions don't match up with the statements, what are you supposed to do? And of course, the Christian was just like, oh, I just know God is loving because that's what the Bible says. Well, that's true. But that's not a satisfactory answer for this person. And it wasn't a satisfactory answer for me either. Because when you do look through the Bible, you do see a number of very heavy, hectic things that God does. And how can I then say that God is love when he says, kill all the Amalekites? Not just the men, but the women and the children too. And not just that, the cattle as well. Everything, completely destroy it all. And then I say, that is a loving God. How can we do that? And here is, here is the answer that I came up with. The only thing that God could do to, sh- to prove to me that he is not a loving God would be to do those things and then not allow me to have an opinion about it. To not allow me to judge him in what he has done. That would prove that he is a vindictive and capricious and megalomaniacal. I can never even say that word, megalomaniacal God. If he does those things and then says, you, have, you can have no opinion and you can't judge what I've done. You just have to accept it. But what we see in the Bible is that we have a God who does do these things, but does it so out in the open that we can know why he's done it and we can understand that in doing it, he is doing the most loving and just and honorable and fair thing to bring sal- the ultimate goal of salvation to human kind and this is why the judgment is so important is because it is it is what proves that god is a loving god you see this is just a little graphic that we can see there are three stages to god's judgment there is the investigative judgment the pre-advent investigative judgment as it's often known and this is the judgment that happens before christ returns to the earth Uh, Then there is the judgment that occurs during the millennium, the 1,000 years after Christ has returned to the earth. And then there is at the very end of the millennium, the great white throne judgment, the final end of the judgment. And you can see the scriptural references for where these are found there. We don't have time to go into this, but this is just a little graphic to help you understand a bit about what God's purpose is in these judgments. You see, in the investigative judgment, God, God, God judges the cases of all before the second coming and the resurrection. And it's decided this person's saved and this person's lost. Now, we don't see this here on earth. No, we have no idea. Because it's happening in heaven. But we do know that there are other worlds out there, other created beings who God has created, and there are the angels as well, watching on. And in seeing and in doing this judgment, God is showing to them that he is just and he is fair in whom he chooses to save and who he chooses to damn. And so in this, in this, who is judging? Well, the angels and the other worlds are judging God's decision. Now, the verdict that comes is, is those who trust God are judged to be saved, and those who are selfish are judged to be lost. And Jesus takes the saved people to heaven when he returns. 
The result is that the angels and the other worlds see that God is love. But then we have the issue of people getting to heaven. And once again, you may get there and I'm not there. And you may be thinking, wait a second, what's going on? Or Isaiah may get there, the prophet Isaiah, and he gets there and King Manasseh is there. And the last thing he remembers of King Manasseh is that he was condemning Manasseh for burning his children alive as in sacrifices to Molech and then Manasseh ordering him to be sawn in half. And that is how Isaiah died. And now he gets to heaven and Manasseh is there. And he's like, hold up. God, you know, I can understand, you know, why you would let me in because I've been a faithful servant to you. And I can understand why you let all these other people in because, you know, they, 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 they understand and follow the gospel. But Manasseh, this guy, you know, he, he burned his children alive and, 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 and he sawed me in half. Now, I, don't, I doubt that's what's actually going to happen, but God is able to open the books. And it says in Revelation 20 verse 4 that judgment will be given to the saints and that the books will be opened and that they will be able to see why those are saved are saved and why those are lost are lost. You see, the saved are now judging God's decisions. And the verdict they come to is the saved see why those who are saved are saved and why those who are lost are lost. And they decide that, yes, God is just and God is fair and God is love. And the saved people see that God is love. And then finally, at the end of the millennium, there's still a group of people who haven't yet seen God's character vindicated before them. And that is those who are lost. During this time, they've been sleeping in the dust. Uh, and at when, but when the new Jerusalem returns to the earth at the end of the millennium, they are raised again and they surround the city. And before they have a chance to, to storm the city, to attempt to storm the city, they are halted and the great white throne judgment begins. You see, and at this judgment is when the wicked judge whether or not God is righteous or fair or love. You see, the lost get to see why those who are saved are saved and why those who are lost are lost. And at the end of this, they will all acknowledge and know that God is love. And God destroys sin and selfishness and everyone who is sinful and selfishness. And as a result of this complete vindication, sin will never arise again the second time. All see, all judge that God is love. Revelation 22.11 says, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And I'm just now coming to the last part of this sermon right here. The, the, the third and last sec segment of this sermon. You see, the key word in this passage is let. And it's, it appears here four times. It says, He who is unjust, let him be unjust. He who is filthy, let him be filthy. He who is righteous, let him be righteous. And he who is holy, let him be holy. The word let is a word that is entirely imbued with the idea of freedom of choice. Because at the end of the day, once again, the judgment is not so much God deciding who's saved and who's lost, but God acknowledging people's decisions to be saved or be lost. You see, in the judgment, God is not actually the one making the decision. He's the one acknowledging the decisions that are already been made. God says, I respect your decision and I acknowledge your choice to be filthy. Or I respect your decision and I acknowledge your choice to be holy. Now, C.S. Lewis has this incredible quote speaking about this idea. He says, in the end there are only going to be two classes of people. Those who say to God, your will be done, and those who, who, to whom God says, your will be done. Think about that. Only two classes of people at the end. Those who say to God, your will be done, and those to whom God says, your will be done. Because it's all about freedom of choice. And so when I was talking earlier about this idea of judgment and asked if you are afraid of God's judgment, it's not that you should be afraid of God and his decisions that he's going to make in the future. No, it's much more that you should be acknowledging and afraid of yourself and your decisions that you are making right now. That is because God respects your freedom of choice so much. But there is good news still in this judgment. Revelation 12.10 says, For the accuser of our brethren, who has accused them before our God day and night, has been cast
cast down. Who is the accuser? Satan. The dragon is the accuser of the brethren. And so let's imagine, let's, let's, let's look at this court scene in heaven. There is the accuser, the one who is the, the one who is going to be making the case that this person is guilty and they should be going to hellfire. And we know who that is. In, in your case, you're standing there and there is an accuser who comes forth and he's going to make the case that you deserve eternal, uh, eternal hellfire in its consequences, of course, not in its duration. <laughs> uh, and he is the serpent, the devil. Who then is the judge? John 5.22 says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. So, Jesus then is the judge and in, in this end time scenario, in, in this judgment scenario. This is good news. Great news. Fantastic news. Think about it. Jesus offers to be our best friend. He's the one who extends to us his grace for forgiveness of sins and offers, he stands at the door of our heart and knocks. Not only that, but he is someone who knows what it's like to be human, knows what it's like to suffer temptation, and knows and, and offers to give us the victory over the sins in our lives. But he is our best friend as well. He's our best friend and he's our brother. So imagine you're going to court and you realize that the judge who's going to decide your case is your best friend and your brother. Wow. You'd be thinking, this is, this, is a pretty, this is a pretty lucky deal for me. Not only that, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So, you have a defense lawyer. That's what an advocate is. And who is the defense lawyer? Well, the defense lawyer is Jesus. He's the same person as the judge. Not only is the judge your defense lawyer, but your judge and your defense lawyer are your brother and your best friend. Man, this is starting to look pretty good, isn't it? Revelation 1.5 And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, this court, says, this court is in session. The judge is sitting. He's also your defense lawyer. And they say, hey, do we have a witness? He says, yes, I have a witness. It's myself. And I witness that this child has chosen me to be their Lord and Savior. And to walk in the love and the redemption that I offer them. And the grace and the, and the character growth and the development and the sanctification that I give them. I am a true and faithful witness to this person's character and this person's choice. The faithful and true witness is the same person as our judge. He's the same person as our advocate. He's the same person who is our best friend and our brother. And finally, there is, this, there is this picture that we often see in our children's books growing up of us standing before the law of God, which we have broken. Undeniably, we have broken. But this picture is so wrong. So, 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 so wrong. And it's instilled in a generation. A wrong theology of judgment. A wrong understanding of judgment in that even if we've chosen Christ, it is us who stands before God in judgment. No, you must get this thought out of your mind. Get this false idea out of your mind because the one who is the accused it turns out, isn't actually you. It's him. Second Corinthians 5.21 For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, you're standing in this court, right? And there's the accuser, and he's saying all the nasty things that you've always done. And it's true. And you're like, there's no way. There is no way I can be saved. I've trampled upon God's law. I'm a terrible sinner, corrupt from my birth. 
But your judge, who is also your defense attorney, and who is also your witness, says, Yes, my friend, my child, my brother, my sister, you have broken the law. You are deserving of God's wrath. But I've already paid the price in your place. As the one who wrote the law, as the one who created you, I became sin for you. So that when you chose me, you might become the righteousness of God in me. There is no need to be afraid of this judgment if you let Jesus Christ be your Lord and Savior. Our key conclusions then. Everyone will have their name come up before God in the judgment. It is possible to fall away and be lost even after you have accepted God's salvation. God is the perfect judge because he knows the hearts even though we cannot. And judgment is a word that has two stages to it, investigation and the declaration and sentencing. Our God investigates when he judges to be transparent to those of us who cannot read hearts and minds. In his judgments, God, as our judge, is on trial, not just us. God is comprehensively and transparent when he judges in the end, so that in the end all will see that he is fair and love. In the judgment, God simply acknowledges our choices to be saved or lost. Jesus is our judge, our defense attorney, our witness, and if we choose him, he stands in our place as the accused. You see, throughout your whole life, God has been in a passionate pursuit of you and is seeking to aid you in making the right decision so that you will be together for eternity. Jesus offers to be your judge, your lawyer, your witness, and to stand in your place as the accused. Will you let him do this for you today? You who are watching this right now, will you commit to let him be this and do this for you? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you so much for the Bible and the clear, coherent, beautiful picture it contains revealing your love from Genesis to Revelation, revealing a God of justice and judgment who is open and transparent so that we may know what it is that you are doing and who it is that you really are. Lord, help us to not be afraid of your decision at the end, but to rather acknowledge the weight of our decisions every day. And Lord, right now we want to ask you to come in to our hearts, to be our Lord, our Savior, our Judge, our Witness, our Advocate, and our Substitute. Not from anything that we deserve or have merited by our works, by our deeds, but simply because you have offered this through your love. Lord, we choose today to let you do this in our hearts. That at the end, we may know that we have said, your will be done. And can enter in to a bliss of eternity, of falling in love forever with you. We ask this prayer in the name of Jesus, in whom we have this incredible hope. Amen. Well, everyone, thanks for tuning in. I uh, hope this message was a blessing uh, to you. Uh, if you have any questions about it, just uh, send me a message, send me an email. Uh, we can schedule a Bible study or something like that. Otherwise, uh, tune in next week for our next uh, service. Uh, and we hope to have some 
uh, announcements for you then about things that may be happening in regards to uh, the church possibly possibly opening. We don't know. We still have to have those meetings. But that is something that's definitely happening on the horizon. We're being being considered on the horizon. So stay tuned and stay uh, stay up to date with us. And we'll see you next week. God bless. Have a wonderful Sabbath.